Okay, thank you very much. Uh, no time to wait for this excellent opportunity to, uh, to talk about um, the no time to wait effect. Um, so I'll just read the introduction. Uh, working as an, audio, um, an audiovisual archivist can be an isolating experience. Conversations about metadata, checks on codecs and wrappers can lead to pained expressions from colleagues taxed enough with their own technicalities. Thoughts turn to expensive vendors offering one-stop solutions that make all these difficult questions go away. But then you discover a small paradise where people like yourself gather and share knowledge under the banner of open source. So this panel today brings together developers and archivists who have benefited from the generous support and encouragement of the No Time to Wait crowd. Um, and who reflect upon the impact this exposure has had on their career and developments and work practices. So I'm going to start with the introductions. I'm Joanna White, as you heard yesterday from the Media Archive of Central England. Um, last year I was very curious about FFV1 uh, with Stephen McConaughey at the BFI, who um, extended an invitation for me to take part in a roundtable. And from that point onwards, I've been accelerated um, my, my kind of activities at the Media Archive of Central England, implementing lots of open source. Act, um, softwares um, into the workflows, and there's no looking back. I love no time to wait. <laughs> Hello, so you may remember me from talking yesterday. Uh, so I'm the main creator of Matroska that many of you use. I'm also a VLC developer, and I've been on no time to wait one, two, and four. Hi. Um, I'm Kieran O'Leary uh, from the Irish Film Institute. I sp spoke yesterday, um, and I've been at all four, no time to wait. And the whole thing is um, very, very important to me, so it's nice to be able to talk about it today. Hi, I'm Jonas Svatos. I talked just a few minutes ago. I come from Narodní filmy archive in Prague. It's my fourth year in digital archive, audiovisual archiving. I originally come from IT. And it's also my, I've been to all uh, No Time to Wait. And I was always fascinated how uh, deeply is the idea of open source embodied in the whole community. And that's why I'm coming back every year. Um, okay, so straight into the first question. Um, what impact or change have you experienced following interaction with the No Time to Wait community? And how might we define what the no time to wait effect is? Um, does anyone want to start? Shall I start? <laughs> Steve just said there, Kieran, you like to speak. Um, <laughs> um, I guess my, my experience with the community itself, I guess, kind of started a bit before no time to wait. Like um, my interactions with people on the EMEA L mailing list, I guess, on Twitter and different things like that, and then eventually on GitHub. Um, I'm pretty sure FF Improviser didn't, didn't exist before. Yeah, no, it was invented, I think, a few months before, maybe at the EMEA conference before um, the first No Time to Wait. But I, I, I kind of knew some of these people, but I'd never met them in real life. And so I think it was probably Dave Rice um, um, asked me if I was interested in coming, and I was like deeply honored and terrified about the whole thing as well, because I've got like social anxiety disorder. Like, like I was diagnosed with it a while back, even though I think I'm, as Steve says, I talk a lot. But like, I'm actually, can be quite shy sometimes. And so the idea of actually just meeting those people was a huge barrier to overcome. And like, meeting Dave and Ashley was actually, t and Rito was like terrifying. Um, but they were just super nice and uh, always have been. And I felt like so welcomed here. And um, it was just great in terms of like, what is the effect? I think, um, Probably myself and Joanna, and maybe I don't know Jonas as well. We are, it's probably just an accelerated development after the first one that we went to, and um, um, it's like I just soaked in as much knowledge as possible from all of the talks and talked to as many people as possible. And I think I just tried to approach everything with an open mind, and um, I just came back and wrote up about a four-page document that I sent around to everyone, saying these are the things that people in our community are doing and some of the kind of the, the philosophies that they hold and this you know, approach to their work. And it seems to work, and it's a viable way to do things. This um, engaging with developers, with standard specifications. It's, it's, that, it's the crossover um, with, with all the different people within, um, the different types of people within uh, No Time to Wait, I think is what can be so powerful about it. 
Um, I, would, I would agree with that. It's the overwhelming welcome that I remember the first year I was just absolutely overwhelmed with it. And, and definitely tooling up, you know, the, the available tools um, through the No Time to Wait community as well, just the things that you can implement more easily because you, the developers are in the same room as you and that, that's really helpful, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, I would say also maybe the effect for me is, is the, the kind of feedback as well that you, you are encouraged to give and that you just want to give when you've received so much from, from like Dave and from you, Kieran, and Ashley and, and others too. Um, you just want to be able to share that and pass it on. And that for me is the effect. It's that kind of, it turns you into a bit of a channel for no time to wait. Like being here today, this is very going against the grain for me. I would never do anything like this. Um, but I want to because I really admire this community and I want, I want it to succeed. So. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I would totally agree with the fact that uh, as we are, uh, everybody uh, a little bit socially awkward by default. <laughs> that was so uh, great to, to, to come here. I actually uh, feel that there's no barrier between the high-profile, let's say, uh, people and newcomers, and uh, especially when it comes to uh, like uh, searching in the dark, let's say, like that uh, you know that you're not alone here, there, and you have maybe the same ideas, and there are people you can talk to, and actually that you can reach consensus, and that, that's one of the key things I think that we can reach upon something. Yeah. Well, I think I'll talk about the human level later, but. In, times, in terms of work, for me, the no time effect, no time to wait effect, uh, was uh, the difference between the first no time to wait and now. At the first one, we were just trying to convince to use Matroska FFV1, and half of the people were very skeptical that they could be useful, or why would we, uh, they use something they never heard of? And then we're now at uh, no time to wait for, and it seems that most people are using that. Uh, I remember at no time to wait, two people were saying, oh yeah, now I'm considering it. I, I'm probably going to use it, but still we had no idea. And now it happened, and uh, uh, I think it's actually because, almost only because of this conference, and probably uh, from the, uh, the work from Dave and Jerome and Ashley and spreading the word. Uh, um, so. Actually, a question for you, Steve. Something you said yesterday that when you, when you launched Matroska, happy birthday, by the way, you had absolutely no experience with video at all. So how has the community helped, helped you in that way? Well, I did a bit of a video, analog video side project in school just for fun, but uh, also studied a bit video compression at university, but uh, I had no idea what even a fine file format for video was. Uh, uh, and I mean, here I still feel like an outsider, I just, but it seems like most of you all learn by yourself, uh, like you as well. Uh, so I, and here I'm still learning. Uh, I, like every every year, I'm learning a lot just coming here. I, I remember um, I think some tweets from four years ago from you where you said you'd learned the term "born digital" for the first time yeah. from coming to this. And there was a couple of maybe even normalization or something might have been a new normalization, term. Normalization, yeah. normalization, uh, fixity, which was built in Matroska, but I didn't know it had a, <laughs> existed for as a term. Uh, so for the archivists on this panel, we have a question quickly. Sorry, Steve, just for a minute. Um, have you discovered new pathways to progression in your career, allowing for greater focus on the work of the individual within your institution? Well, as for, for me, I don't see it as a career path or anything like that, because I've been to uh, like computers way before I joined AV. But uh, I think that for most of the people who do not come from the uh, computer science background, this should be inherent in the, in the educa education as well. And I think, I hope that this conference only bridges the gap between the, the time where there was nothing and 
the time when this is all embodied in the in the curriculum, in the for example, I don't know, PNP and other um, programs where uh, one should uh, be able to to suck these things not only uh, in his spare time but all, all, as a as a as a part of his education. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the out, I think. Um, a lot, a lot of the work I was doing before No Time To Wait, um, some of it was kind of in live production, we'll say, but a lot of it was still kind of experimental. Like, even, even the first, well, when myself and Rito were presenting on the um, taking film scans and turning them into FFV one, you know, we were just acknowledging that there's, there was a gap here, you know, and then with, it didn't quite work, which is why we needed Raw Cooked. But I think um, when I came back and it's legitimized the work and instead of just kind of tinkering away in my spare time I ended up getting like developer in my title I've like had several promotions since and I'm like I'm a manager now I really think that came from like I think I was legitimized by being at this conference and actually speaking and t talking about the work and uh, people didn't like criticize it that much or anything it was all really positive so I, I give huge amounts of credit to No Time To Wait and all the people behind it as well. That it really, really helped me. Um. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I feel that just in a very short space of time, the association of No Time To Wait, the cross-collaboration and, and the types of people that it brought into my world um, really helped me um, implement some significant changes at the Media Archive Central England. And I'm very grateful to them for their bravery at allowing that to happen as well. Um, it became a bit of a thing whenever we were presented with an issue or an anomaly that we couldn't quite quote. I would say, shall I just tweet the guys at no time to wait? Shall I just tweet the community and have a word, you know? And Dave and Kieran particularly have been absolutely amazing in, in supporting us in this year. So, um, Also, Pathways, I would say, ultimately, the last year has led to my new career at the BFI, which starts next week. I'm very excited about working with Stephen McConaughey, um, who I think is a great advocate for open source. Um, so yeah, Pathways, definitely. This place opens up all sorts of doors that could, could surprise you. Um, so next question. Um, am I right in thinking that the original concept behind No Time to Wait was the urgent need to address obsolescence of videotape? Um, equipment and media, and are we reaching a point when No Time to Wait has achieved its original intention, raising awareness of videotape vulnerability? Well, I can give it a go, but I almost never work with anything analog. I mean, uh, I'm usually uh, very digital, even long time ago, I didn't... I, I, I used to DJ, for example, in Paris, I was almost the first one using computers to DJ because I didn't like vinyls. So I couldn't tell much about the analog world, uh, but uh, certainly, yes, I, I like to uh, help making the transition better. Yeah. Because we, we were talking about this at lunchtime, and I was—it's I was, like, been so long ago, and I was trying to remember the original goals of um, the first No Time to Wait. And it, it, I mean, it seemed to be very much aligned with the pre-forma project you know, um, regarding, like, you know, the actual um, like open-source formats um, and, and tools surrounding them, and very much so. Yeah, videotape. Um, you know, the, the, the race to migrate our collections was very, very much a part of that. I think over the years, it's become less and less like FFV1, Matroska centered. It's really more about this kind of different open approach to work and these like um, intersections between all these different parts of our community. And I, I think it's had, I think it's had a, a, a huge influence um, in the larger like no time, no, non no time to wait community. I'm not gonna like, I'm like Amia plays a huge part in it as well, but um, like, I, I remember if, um, there was a panel um, at FIAF about like two years ago that myself, uh, Jerome, uh, Bert, Clem um, Bert Lemons from Pact, um, and Yvonne Ng were, were all at. And like, I think we would probably be more, more associated with No Time to Wait in this conference, and we'd kind of infiltrated that place. Um, where I remember Steve McConaughey saying that like, tape generally wasn't really ta talked about that much at FIAF, would be cor correct in saying. Um, and I think that maybe No Time to Wait gave some of us a, a platform that we were able to go to other places as well. Um, and we were maybe legitimized in some way, maybe, in my opinion. 
And videotape still scares me a lot. I feel like there's so much I don't know about it. And just from last year's presentation by um, Ben on um, uh, time codes, and um, this year again on closed captioning and various things I've discovered this last year about pixel aspect ratio discrepancies. You know, there's, I think there's still a lot to do with videotape, certainly. So. Well, I think we should scare pe more pe people more because I don't think this is nearly or even even remotely done because there's still so many collections which are were not locked upon, uh, locked upon, including our videotape collection because we have not yet transferred everything and we are still uh, like lagging uh, apart or away. So I hope there is more of us and uh, that yeah we should we should probably raise the voice more as in the previous presentation yeah i think it's also quite significant that the bfi are doing their h2022 project at the moment as well 100,000 plus videotapes transfers i think it's really exciting that they've picked matroska and ff1 as the format and it's really great for regional archives in the uk to to have that validation um, that the BFI are using this format, it makes it a lot easier to implement, um, which is, is great for people like me. <laughs> yeah, so even although I don't work in the analog world, I actually, like you said, for example, for uh, time code and closed caption, we actually have to find ways to store them in Matroska, for example, in for time codes, we are we're actively working on it, to find a proper proper solution. We actually have three good solutions, uh, so we have to make decisions, but uh, so yeah, it still has uh, an impact on our uh, work for the standardization of Matroska. There's still stuff to do before we are fully uh, covering all the issues that you can find in your work. I think Kieran touched on it earlier. Um, about all the other cross-disciplinary um, activities that are going on at No Time To Wait. And um, I wonder, if, based on a tweet that Dave put a few days ago where he flipped products, I loved it, it was like a little angry bear tweet where he was just flipping the word products. Um, are we moving towards a productless community that relies on custom-made software by archivists for archivists? Um, and how do we ensure this collaborative practice remains sustainable? There's definitely more of it going on. Um, it does seem to be like people making their own scripts, and um, I think in terms of like making to, like tools of the tools like QC tools and V Record and all this, a lot of that does have Dave Rice at its core, you know, um, like very much so. Like he's the center of so much of these things. Um, like any any work that I've done, it's it's largely just been piggybacking on other command line tools and stuff like that. So. It's like nothing too significant. Uh, off the top of my head, I'm not. Sh I, I think we, as, as a field, we're still probably very much tied to products. Um, but I think that huge progress has been made in the last couple of years. Um, I don't think, um, like you can probably speak about this. It just, you, I'm sure Mace has kind of been transitioning over to um, more of a, you know moving away from products into custom workflows in the last year as well. We have yes. Um, and it's been a big ask, really. You know, it is a big ask for people to do that, I think. Um, tooling up and preparing um, your work environment to work with things that you don't have technical support for and that you are the technical support yourself or your community are. It's, it's, it's difficult to ask people to do that. Um, but you don't need to be a developer, I found, to install something, to try and use it, and, and to share the process of your doing that. Um, just be daring enough to go onto a GitHub and use that and interact with the developers. Um, it's, it's really liberating and it's really um, validating of the, the steps you make and that you're actually giving back to the community. I think it's, it's a really worthwhile process. And it is, it's nice to, to know that you're actually moving into an environment that's controlled by your own people. You know? It's not, it's not going to be um, just suddenly sh cut down cut off and shut down by, by a vendor at some point in the future. We, we can make things that actually work for us and are sustainable in the future. And that, I think, is really good. I think it's also good, sorry, when large institutions like the Irish Film Institute and British Film Institute lead the way. Again, like I said earlier, it, it really gives confidence to the rest of the field. So. 
Well, as, uh, as for product-based uh, state, I, I don't think that uh, there is no product without open source, because if you look at the Marvel's things, which Maria Area and Jerome Martinez does, it's uh, one of the models which seems to be s sustainable, where you actually buy open source, because you're not just buying the product, you're buying the work behind it, and if not this, you can always uh, buy the support for your product, and this is actually one of the main business models between uh, large uh, open source projects, which are then funded by by those uh, by by by, the, by these monies, as, as in many Linux distributions, for example, or offerings. Yeah. yeah actually, just on that, yeah, I mean, you're saying about the no time to wait effect and things like that, but like I actually think it's. Um, the idea yeah, of, of paying for free software. Um, I think that message was like being made every year, every year um, by multiple presenters. And I think each year it makes more and more sense to people. Um, if you see like all the names that are attached to Raw Cooked at the moment, like it's really, really encouraging because I don't think, um, I just think it was a very different environment four years ago, you know? Um, I guess there, there's just been a lot of people um, like I, I remember when, when I'd heard that the, the MediaTek, um, and I, I don't know, maybe Cooney as well, sponsored FFE 1v3, or was it just MediaTek? Um, it was so inspiring. Um, and I'd, I'd never really heard of it before, of anybody really doing that. And now it seems to be happening more and more, and it's, it's wonderful. Well, being on the other side of the open source products, I mean, I. Carl would probably say the same, but it's really nice to see people that are not only use the stuff we do, but actually first enjoy it, understand it, want to push it forward, and are also being nice when they ask and are helpful. Uh, so, I mean, for us, it's uh, the perfect combination. Uh, you're winning, and we are also uh, growing uh, what we do, we are learning also, so I mean, uh, for us it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, I, I think using open source is not just monetary decision, but it's also a political decision as well. It's not just about uh, the budget, I think. Um, so, thinking more about the conference and its temporality, um, does the temporality of an annual conference focus generative activity, do you think? Um, ultimately encouraging new ideas or new project developments each year. I know day one of getting here, I was hearing people communicate what they were planning to do next year straight away, <laughs> very excitedly. And it's great to, to, to see the buzz um, in the build up to the event on Twitter, for example, where people are talking about the things they're going to speak about, sending out the teasers. I love that part of, of the conference. Um, so what, how do you all feel about the temporality of the event? Is that one of the things that keeps it sustained, do you think? The fact that it's an annual thing that we... Actually, I remember the first No Time to Wait. I was kind of buzzing when leaving because it was so exciting to find people who understand what we're doing, who are actually happy about it. And basically, every time it's the same thing. L last year, I didn't come, but it was, I was uh, attending remotely, and it was the same. Yeah, I mean, you, the energy, the positive feeling you get from just coming, uh, listening to other people, learning new things, uh, getting new ideas of things to do, and then just after that, it, it pushes you to do more things. And so every year is good. Maybe every six months would even be better. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, every year is great. Um, I hope no time to wait can continue on for a very long time. I, I think I'm, I, I, I usually just, if I'm speaking at an event at no time to wait, I, I don't really feel a huge build up to it or anything like that, or I'm not gearing my work or research. It's just it's whatever I'm working on at the time. But what I find every time, Afterwards, I'd echo Steve. Um, I'm so invigorated and inspired every time. And even just like to pick out one example, of what um, OSA archives, what they were showing yesterday, was just so impressive. 
and there are so many things there I want to investigate or just re, you know um, improve my own work. And like, the, it's interesting that it, it's happening so late this year because um, it's like it's just it's been a long year. It's been a it's mm -hmm. been a hell of a year, and I like it's just. Uh, I think you know we're all very passionate about our work and everything like that, and we all have massive workloads, so it's very easy to get very tired, uh, bordering on the burnout. And like m me at nine o'clock yesterday versus five o'clock yesterday, I was a completely different person. I was so fired up at the end of it, um, just looking forward to the next year of everything that that could be done. I don't know if anyone else had a similar feeling, but um, it's it's great. I'm just yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. That, uh, I was thinking about it that every year when I get back, the, the excitement goes straight up, and then uh, pr proposing for a year, it goes like, like this. And in the end, uh, we should make uh, no time to wait every three months. So the productivity <laughs> would go like the, the graph would be, you know, so, yeah, flatter, yeah. So if we could um, just. We would like to open it to the whole room, really. We're going to talk a, a little bit about what our favorite moments are from the last four years, what notable achievements you think No Time to Wait has achieved, uh, any highlights that you have. Um, we'll start with the panel here. Um, for me, it's technical videos, technical outputs, time codes and captions, as I mentioned. Um, some of the videos that I was looking at before I came here, like the FFV1 stress testing, and um, Rito and Kieran's DPX to FFV1 um, videos were always a massive bonus for me to be able to just look at that resource and use it for my own practice was just amazing. It was, it was a real eye-opener. Um, so that's been one of my highlights to you. For me, it was actually uh, staying at Jerome's place in Berlin. <laughs> it, it doesn't seem like it's related to No Time To Wait, but for me it's completely related because I stayed with his family. Uh, it was like being home and in a family there. Uh, and it feels like the whole conference was just like a group family gathering, and it seems it's always like that. So for me it just, uh, it set the tone for me exactly what to expect, and it, it's, uh, I mean, that's what I expect from No Time to Wait and never disappoints. So thank you, Jérôme. Yeah, I guess like I talked about all the, you know, inspiring technical knowledge and that you can accrue here and all that, but I think all of my favorite moments are just things like just people. Um, Getting, like uh, unexpected things like getting to actually meet Carl Lugan Hoyos from FFmpeg, who was like, you know, he was like ridiculously nice to me. Um, he n knew I was Irish, so he brought a, a hat that was given to him in, can I say where you got it from? Uh, from like NATO, special forces or wherever he used to work. <laughs> Um, and they, he served with loads of Irish soldiers, and they said, like, whenever you meet somebody from Ireland, make sure you wear this hat. And he actually brought it to No Time to Wait. And it was, like, incredibly sweet. Um, and I remember when we were meeting up the night before No Time to Wait 2, I remember Alessandro Luciano, like, was going to moderate a panel with Carl. And at the time, that when you would Google his name, the first thing that came up was a vote to ban Carl Ugin Hoyos from FFmpeg. So everyone was, like, terrified about, like, what, what, what we were going to... Uh, encounter and he was like so sweet but actually my favorite moment I think was, it was a moment I was, I was quite moved by in the first no time to wait when there, that was a three-day conference and the second day there, we, uh, we, some of us went to the I think the zoos Institute and we watched the IETF um, meeting I guess and I think it was maybe Dave Jerome and Steve went and it was so lovely um, when Steve got up to speak and um, he had just talked about um, made a specific uh, note of the concerns of audiovisual archivists, that there are certain features, you know, that we will have to work on. And it just felt like even just after a day at the conference that um, uh, I feel like we had kind of pulled Steve into our world. And I, I, I was just very moved by it, weirdly enough. I, I, I can't, and I explained it to Steve afterwards, and I just thought it was very nice. I don't have an exact moment, but for sure, it has been the standardization process of all 
of either FFE1, FLAC, and EBML in the ITF, because if this things which I'm not exactly right if it originated uh, in this community, I think, um, I might be wrong, but if uh, this all goes forward, it will outlive us all. So I think because we're still waiting to celebrate that it's, or I'm, I'm waiting for it to become an actual RFC and every year I'm go get, going back and waiting, hey, it's gonna be the, oh, next Christmas maybe. So uh, let's wait for another new time to wait if uh, we actually will got the numbers. Oh. Yeah, I think the legacy of the videos actually is really important. Um, the, um, the information that I've gleaned from that has been fascinating, fabulous, and and just the warmth, yeah, like you say, the the kind of sense of belonging when you when you join No Time to Wait in the community and the accessibility you get to great people like these is just wonderful for me. Um, does anybody in the audience like to feed Anyone? into this? I can this? bring you the, the microphone, yeah. Ashley. I think I'd also love to have a, a no time to wait every three months or something, but also as an organizer, it's quite exhausting. And I'm wondering um, if all of you have any ideas of how people can work together and collaborate, um, the best vehicle to do that or to stay in touch throughout the year. Sorry, I didn't mean, of course, I uh, did not want to uh, under, uh, overestimate your work. That I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm so amazed, but by what the whole organizing committee can get done. And I, I, I know that it couldn't be done every three months, of course, yeah. So, but, yeah. I think it's still a lovely idea, though. Um, thank you for the prompt, Ashley. She reminded me to mention that um, a month or two ago, um, after last year's No Time to Wait, I was very eager to continue the conversation and to continue kind of access and communications between this community. And um, a few months ago, Catherine Francis Nagels, who's a wonderful helper on May scripts, approached myself, Kieran, Ashley, and asked if we would like to create a Zulip, which is like um, a kind of an open source version of Slack, I think, um, which Kieran named AV Hackers, I'm blaming him. <laughs> um, and it's called AV Hackers, and it's accessible um, by invitation, or we can um, or you can access it through my GitHub um, under AV Hackers, and it's just a space we haven't we haven't actually defined what it's for really, but it's it's kind of for people to just come together and to chat. Um, I think it's really useful for people in the beginner intermediate stage, possibly to kind of come and ask questions and have a community of really talented people that have already populated it for us. Thank you very much. Many are in the room, um, so yeah, I think that's one of the ways certainly. I think we did like a, a soft launch, I would call it. <laughs> we like, should we set things up? And we're like, no, let's just start inviting people. <laughs> other questions or responses or any other responses to Ashley's proposal about how we might keep in touch better? I'm coming. We have a couple, actually, so uh, get ready. <laughs> so Maya asks, how might the hashtag and TTY community, oh, not time to wait, sorry, engage others rather than all the weight of the work and advocacy being on the archivist slash developers? Sorry, could, could you repeat that? How might the No Time to Wait community engage others rather than all the weight of the work and advocacy being on the archivists and developers? I don't have an answer. So. I don't think I have an answer either. I don't think, I'm, I'm really sorry, Samaya. I, my, my, I'm not braining right. It's, it's the, um, I'm, I'm so sorry. I actually, we should make leaflets like memory of. I feel like I can kind of give an answer. I think that um, so much of this here are inspired by Dave Rice, and Dave Rice is essentially like creating small versions of himself. He has been a mentor to so many people. So if all of us strive to do that just as much, even like a quarter of the amount that Dave does, I think we'll be on our way to um, just sharing the work around. Um, I I'll comment quickly as I take the microphone open to Stephen. Um, to, to get here took a lot of convincing, 
And um, a lot of that came from a lot of some support from Dave and Joanna, who um, wrote me a lot of encouraging emails, but also gave me a lot of um, helpful language to use in convincing um, my institution to send me here. So if anybody has advice about how they um, uh, advocated for themselves or how they, um, how they felt like they, uh, this conference has legitimized them within their institution and they could share that in a way that might help other people uh, make a case for themselves to be here. That could be helpful. And one of the many questions that Erwin asked, sorry, Erwin, we only asked one. Consensus is great, and No Time to Wait is here, and much work in EMEA and other AV organizations are gaining awareness. How do we prevent in-crowding, keep reaching out both to AV and outside? I, I think it helps as well just that um, I think it's becoming much more normalized now that um, archivists are picking up um, more IT skills, command line skills, and engaging with open source. I think just naturally we seem to be um, not just accepting failure when something goes wrong. I think, I think in general we're engaging with um, other communities a lot more. Um, and I think that's quite an infectious thing that can come out of this conference. Is like, and it does help when you have some of the developers in this room. But I'm not sure if that answers the question. I think um, blogging might help. That's, that's the one thing I've, I've fallen on. And I've really enjoyed blogging. And it, the views have been international and quite high numbers. And that surprised me, in truth. Um, how you make them come into this room and engage, though, I, I'm not sure. I guess by, by increased amounts of blogging, maybe, and, and just sort of enthusiasm for the event, hopefully. Do it. Hey, uh, I just would like to comment from, I think it has an amazing impact on individuals and their feeling about work and their you know, ability to cope with the grimmest year on record and all that stuff. But I just thought I'd mention the impact it can have on an organization. Um, and for me, that's really hard to overstate that the, the series has had an incredibly transformative impact on the BFI's approach to, our, to the BFI National Archives approach to our work. It's really easy to, to think back and, and f like have a narrative of how we change from the archive we were to the archive we, we are now. But these events made that happen, really, because it helped to build my confidence that I was in a safe space to, to change and experiment and do things that the broadcasters don't and do new things with the DPXs that industry does and all that stuff. And because I felt confident, I could advocate to my organization and then having no time to wait in the BFI, and I could bring like 20 people. So the, the impact was really huge, and it's actually transformed one of the biggest national archives in the world, this event. Um, and it's, you know, the organizers should take credit. If they can do that for five archives a, a year for the next 20 years, it's like a global transformation. So it really is amazing. And so yeah, thank you so much to everyone. I'll go this way first. Thank you. Um, I think it's not only the conference. I'm, uh, with, um, I'm attending No Time to Wait since its second edition in uh, Vienna. But I think that the live stream and also that we, you are recording or we are recording the uh, thing. And then when we are talking in a professional circle within the Open Society Archives about issues, I can say, yeah, there was a, a, a presentation about this issue and there is an easy way just to send the link so that my colleagues can, so I can always refer to this thing. So I think that this is this transparency, this sharing, uh, this idea of, um, of not being secretive and that there are no, no proprietary ideas. I think it's really an added thing. So thank you very much for recording this and uh, sharing always what uh, all the presentations. Uh, speaking of the live stream, I think we have more questions and then I'm gonna come back to the audience. Um, no, just to say that we are getting a lot of um, engaging and positive feedback also from the people on the live stream. So I guess um, when there are many questions, so I guess if people have specific questions, they can just like connect over Twitter, but generally it's saying that there's like great closing panel and 
um, really sharing all of your points and ideas, and they feel also very welcomed, I'm assuming, from how they're interacting with us through the screen. So yeah, I think that's pretty, that's a sign of success. I'm going to go to this person first because they had their hand. Loda, again, I have something to say what Kieran said. It's more like I come from the IT background and media artist background. So I would say how to uh, broaden the spectrum of people that come here. Bring your IT because that's what Bert did with me two years ago. He brought me to Vienna and now um, this uh, conference has helped me to understand my colleagues better understand my colleagues who are archivists better, understand what they need, and also get all, a lot of inspiration to help them better in the future and, and uh, get new projects done. Yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic idea. There, there are some of us, though, who don't have any IT support. Like, we, we have a company that are outsourced that they'll fix our printers and stuff like that. But everything else we have to do ourselves, unfortunately. But if anyone does have that, that's, that's a wonderful thing. I think, a lot of, I think there is a great skill in um, archivists learning to speak the, uh, the language and terminology, I guess, of IT and having that, um, met that crosswalk. Um, yeah, it's a great idea. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on Bryce's comment earlier uh, about me and Joanna kind of communicating with her and, and encouraging her to join us. Um, I think there are a number of you here who I've had to write uh, invitation emails for sometimes because often like we work in an environment where our organization or bosses or employers don't need some convincing to support our attendance in a conference like this to you know to to engage in that kind of professional development especially in a new conference that is a bit unknown um, and often people need like you know a, a voice or some kind of proof that the representation is an encouraging force here and I just want to say like it, you know so part of like what I've done to help support some people in coming here is, is just like writing an email to be like, you know, uh, Kieran, like you're an excellent subject matter expert, like your, the work you're doing really reflects on our theme this year. Um, you know, maybe you've seen this from the emails I've sent to any of you, but uh, I just want to say like we can be that voice for ourselves to encourage and support ourselves, like to write an email fancy enough that, you know, we can forward it to our boss and get here. <laughs> Thank you for your emails. Anyone else? I don't know what time it is. Uh, a few minutes. A few minutes? Yeah. Um, in your opinion, uh, also in the public, what uh, could we do to, in order to improve even more no time to wait? five, six, seven, I don't know. What is missing for, from your point of view? Uh, what are the, uh, the problems with No Time to Wait? I don't know, I think it's getting better and better every year. I um, don't know, uh, maybe enforce the, or maybe point out the code of conduct more. I think that was something that was maybe said at the end of the last one that it wasn't maybe um, talked about enough. Um, but in general, I think like this is an incredibly like well-run, organized event. Like just it's with the live streaming and like the, the introduction of the stage coordinators in No Time to Wait too. Like it 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 runs so well and it's really really lovely. Um, I I wasn't actually at the the, the work day or the hack day, so maybe um, I, I I'm not sure if if, the, if that worked or if, if that was a good thing or not. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to add that I really liked Julia's presentation this year, and I thought that was really helpful for somebody who's beginning or, or is starting to work with video archiving material. Um, I guess I'd like to see more things like that, maybe, where there's more perhaps group analysis of things. I think it's a really good learning opportunity, so that would be something I would... Yeah, I think the Hack Day was a wonderful idea. I, very, I liked it pretty much. Uh, but I would maybe propose for a next time to have a little bit more rigid structure because as we agree that most of us are a little bit socially awkward, the structure is somehow needed sometimes, but it was, it was fine. But I think there could be um, maybe more groups, more topics because we, have, uh, we had a lot of topics and in the end we ended up only with a fixed set of uh, 
larger groups we, when we discuss something, but other than that, that was wonderful without an issue. I loved it, thanks. Um, well, same for me, uh, the work day was very useful. Uh, I learned a lot as well. And uh, also today and yesterday, so many people have lots of problem in, with playback or with their files or they don't know what's going on. I have so many comments. Uh, so I think, I don't know if it's too short or we don't have time to develop or maybe there should be a, a DB4 after where we can actually discuss the problems and solve them where we can help. So if this is something that the community wants, uh, we could try to do a, like bring your file uh, session next year. Um, I'm happy and I'm sure Steve is as well uh, to look at broken or, well, or non-broken files that don't work and uh, perhaps we can do something about them. That sounds really great. Mm -hmm. Actually, there was this one other thing as well. Like, um, you know, we talked about our experience of like, being at the first one and then coming back and stuff like that. Like, I'd really encourage if there was anyone here who's maybe just been here for the first time, or uh, maybe it's your second time, or maybe to think about speaking even at a lightning talk next year. Um, I mean, the lightning talks can even be just four or five minutes. Just um, or if you've never asked a question, or you know, if you've never really even talked to people that much here, you know, um, to, to get involved in that way. Like, what I always find is like if you end up ever like solving something and you haven't been able to Google it or find it on an EAL or Twitter or something. Um, you shouldn't just keep that knowledge to yourself. Um, you share it in some way, whether it's in a tweet or a blog post or a lightning talk at no time to wait. Like I think a lot of times we don't actually give ourselves credit for some of the innovative problem solving that we do. I think this is a great space to be able to just share. And um, it gets easier every time once you've, sp once you've spoken up here for the first time, it gets easier. Yeah, and, and I would say any level as well, you know, you don't feel like you have to be the ultimate te technician to, to come up and do this. I do not feel that way at all. And um, I'm very privileged to be here sat with these people. But um, yeah, I do feel like an imposter. But yeah, any level, get involved. And definitely being involved and sitting on the stage or standing on the stage, um, it brings people to you in a way that just general participation doesn't do. And that I think is incredibly valuable. I think, are we on time? Any other comments from, no, oh, one more. Uh, I, I think it's a good idea to have uh, particular examples discussed, but if possible, you know, in the whole group, I especially like the questionable file presentation where actually there was uh, something presented and the feedback going on for everybody, so. Uh, I think that format could be a good thing. And generally, I think it's, it's always a problem in, in, uh, in conferences that there is, on one hand, you have a lot of presentations and you want to see them. On, on the other hand, you want to talk to individuals or do networking or whatever. So um, this year, I've, I found it quite good. But maybe uh, on the side of organizers, don't forget the time where people have the time to, like the breaks where you have the time to talk to each other. Uh, it just comes to my mind as you say this, that maybe there we could make a call for, if I see on the participants list somebody with whom I would like to talk to, that's, there could be a platform on which I could reach out or ask the organizing committee to to help us come together because all I don't attach faces to names or so somehow to facilitate this if it's possible. Other comments? Are we done? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much.